And so the Lord has a blessing for each and every one of you here today. Is anybody else here ready to receive what God has for them? Then let's give God what he deserves. Let's give him all the praise, honor, and glory. Would you raise your hands with me this morning? Heavenly Father, God, we love you, we honor you, King of heaven and earth, Lord God, we praise you here today, and we humbly say that Jesus is Lord, and we invite you to come, Holy Spirit, come move in our midst, come have your way, Lord God, may your presence be more manifest and real in this house than ever before. Father God, may the reality of eternity be rest in this house, Lord God, and may you continue to draw us closer to you, Father God. We thank you today, we celebrate our God. God is love, and he so loved us that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. And so God, here today, may we lift up the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, do what you want. Come and save and heal and sanctify and deliver and do what only you can do. We come in that mighty name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. Church, I've got a question for you this morning. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? <laughs> you know why I have this joy down inside of me this morning? It's not necessarily because I'm here doing ministry or because of anybody that's here, but it's because I'm a son. <laughs> I'm a son of the Most High God. And whenever I was a little child, whenever I was hungry, I didn't have to worry about anything because I knew my dad would feed me. And he's here to feed you today. I love that psalm. It says, the, <laughs> oh, Jesus. I'm sorry, y'all. Y'all just got to deal with me this morning. I'm full of it. Whew. The joy of the Lord. In the midst of chaos, he's faithful. <laughs> oh, he stays so faithful. Whew. I'm just so overwhelmed by him. Oh, how the deer... The way that it pants for the water is how my soul longs for him. Come on. Let's come to the river today. Amen. You ready, church? Let's worship. One, two, three, four. Brothers, sisters, come on down to that river. Guarantee you'll never be the same. There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the same. Bring your sins and all your guilty stains. Let that river of life wash it all away. You've been searching, carrying burdens. You've been lost and looking for the home. Who's drifting? Who's missing? You should know.
so thankful that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in us <laughs> that we've been given authority over every evil thing
His love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same.
morning church can anybody else testify that our God is good amen amen oh, it's so good to be with you all this morning I don't know about you but every week what I'm most thankful for when I come here is I know every time that the presence of God is going to fill the house amen anybody else thankful for a spirit-filled church. Oh, I wouldn't trade anything for that. Amen? Somebody offer us to be the richest church in America if you just take the presents. No, thank you. Somebody to offer to give us the fanciest preacher we've ever seen. First of all, I get fired, and I don't like that, but still, nonetheless, if it means trading the presents, no thank you. Amen? Before we get into the Word today, Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we honor you in your presence. And we want to be a people of your presence. We want to walk in your presence. We want to live close to you. And so, God, here today, Lord God, may, may you speak in this house. God, more than ever, we draw near to you. And we pray right now, Father God, that you would be the speaker of the hour, that you get me and get us out of your way. And you just give us ears to hear your voice, hearts to receive it, eyes to see it. And God, that there be supernatural transformation that takes place today. You're the God who changes us from the inside out. And we thank you for this, Lord God. And so you come and change us and mold us into the image of your son, Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for this and the power of your word. For it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And all God's people said... Amen. I just love the story of a fella. He was walking on the beach, and for years he had served the Lord, and the Lord just spoke to his heart and said, Son, just ask me for whatever you want today. He says, Nothing's too big. And the fella was walking on the beach on the West Coast, and he looked across the ocean, and he thought, You know, God, I've always wanted to go to Hawaii. He said, But I'm afraid to fly, and I'm afraid to sail. Can you just build me a bridge? And God said, son, do you realize the logistics in building a bridge that big? He said, are you crazy? He said, do you not, is there nothing else you want? And the fellow thought for a moment. He said, well, you know, I've been married to my wife. I love her. We've been together for over 40 years. But I still don't really understand her. I don't, I don't understand why, why, the way she thinks or why she does what she does. Can, can, can you help me understand women? And there was just a long, silent pause, and finally God said, would you like for that bridge to be two lanes or four? <laughs> oh, well. This morning, whether you laughed at that joke or whether that joke got you in trouble or whether you laughed and that's what got you in trouble, 
title of today's message is that God is for you. <laughs> God is for you. Has anybody here ever been misunderstood? Been misunderstood. And, and our natural reaction is this. Well, if they just knew me better, or if they would just, if they would just listen to my side of the story, if they just let me explain myself. But here's the thing. <laughs> Listen, what we have to learn to do is this. We just have to learn to trust and put our situation and our reputation in the God who's for us. <laughs> put it in God's hands. Remember, the scripture tells us that the battle belongs to God. That our God is for us. And just like the prophet told the king, King Jehoshaphat, when they faced an army far too large for them to ever defeat on their own, he says, you know what? You all just stay at peace. Don't be, don't be afraid and don't be discouraged because the battle isn't yours. It's your God's. And so instead of trying to figure it all out and trying to fix it all themselves, the king did something bold. He said, you know what? If God fights our battles... Then, and if, then we're just going to worship. And as they headed out into the battle, they sent the worship team, the praise team, ahead of the army. And as they began to worship and just let God be God, God fought their battle for them and defeated the enemy, and they never had to draw a sword. Tell your neighbor, God's fighting your battles for you. And we need this. Do you realize this? We, sometimes we think, well, I, I'm living right or I'm doing my best. And we think if we do our best and we live right and we try to serve God, that everybody will like us. <laughs> Jesus was sinless and they hated him. Jesus was the spotless lamb of God and they crucified him for it. Think about that, church. Jesus was absolutely perfect. And so it is not our job to go around straightening everybody out, every, getting everybody to, to think we're great. You know what our job is? Instead of focusing on what they're saying or doing, let's get our eyes focused on Jesus. Because he's our righteousness and he's our defender. He is for you. Look in your Bibles in Romans 8.31. He says what? Then shall we say to these things? He says, if God is, say it with me, for us. God is for you. Let that sink in for a moment. Because the next word is what? Who? Whatever's coming against you, whoever's coming against you, they fit in the who category. God is for us. And he's dealing with the who. <laughs> who can be against us? Listen, we don't need everybody on our side because we have the most high God on our side. Somebody hearing this this morning. You may want everybody fighting for you, but you don't need that because you have the most high God fighting for you. And one plus God is a majority. And we can rest in that and we can be still and just know that God is God. How much is God for you? Well, he says in the next verse, he, that's God who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us. He handed him over to be crucified, to die on an old rugged cross for sinners like you and me. That's how much God is for you. To take his only begotten son, his beloved son, and hand him over to die on an old rugged cross to become sin for you and me, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. If he would go all the way to the cross for you, then there's nothing happening to you this week, this morning, or in this lifetime that he will not defend you. He is your defender. He says, how shall we not with him also freely give us how much? Say it with me. All things. Say it again. All things. 
Tell your neighbor, all means all. Verse 33. Oh, I love this. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Imagine that. God, to be God's elect means he, he chose you. And imagine this. God chose you and then, and then someone else or some devil dares to accuse you. He says it is God who justifies. <laughs> to justify means to declare righteous. Listen, he's speaking here of the, when you bring a charge, he's speaking of the throne room, the courtroom of God. And what he's saying is this, when the devil begins to rail at you, begins to lie about you, begins to smear you, this is all you got to do. You just say this, I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood over me, my home, my church, my city. I plead the blood and the all righteous judge. Listen. This is one stacked court, everybody, because the judge is the one who gave his son to die for you. The judge is your heavenly father. Come on, church. Can anybody get excited this morning? Boy, don't we need this. We live in a day where, listen, even on social media, people judge us that don't even know us. And we could get all caught up. Did you see what so-and-so posted or what so-and-so said? And sometimes they'll do it outright. And sometimes they like to do things that they imply, these little digs and these different things. And sometimes they'll even misquote scripture and take it out of context, thinking that's a weapon. But God, listen, God's word is to be used what God intended it for. And it was never to get a dig at somebody else. Praise God. You cannot use God's weapon. His word is a weapon against people. But you can use it as a weapon against your real enemy. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But against principalities and powers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. This is a stacked court. Let's put our reputation in the hands of Jesus Christ, the one who bled and died, the one who says you're my righteousness, the one who says I'm coming back to take you home, the one that's going to dress you in a white robe, the one that's got a supper waiting on his family to come and gather around the great supper of the Lamb. Oh, he's the one fighting for you. Hallelujah. The Lord reminded me of this. I don't know about you, but... Heights aren't my favorite thing. I'm not sure if I have a phobia of them. I'll, I'll do it, but I don't like it. And I've been climbing a ladder before, and I'd be like, wow, I'm doing really good. And then I look down. You're reading me here. I'm not scared as long as I keep my eyes looking up. Come on. God says he's taking you from glory to glory. While you're on your way up, don't look down. Don't let the enemy's lies distract you. Don't know what the enemy's doing. Get you scared. Peter could walk on water as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus. We're going to keep our eyes on Jesus this morning and let him fight our battles. See, your whole life changes when you know God is for you. You begin to live different. And so the Lord showed me this week. That the first step in living like you know God is for you is, number one, to let God be your defender. Let God be your defender. Turn in your Bibles to Romans 12. The Bible in the book of Esther speaks of a man who served God faithfully. His name was Mordecai. Most people didn't know who Mordecai was. He seemed like a relative nobody. But how many of y'all know, you may not be known by everybody here, but where you want to be popular is with the Most High God. He knows who you are. And so he served God faithfully, and a very wicked man rose to power, the king's prime minister, the second most powerful man in the kingdom. And, and everywhere this man walked, people would bow down to him and treat him like he was a god. But remember, the Ten Commandments tell us to have no other gods before us. And so they would come and they would bow down, and, but Mordecai wouldn't bow because he wasn't going to treat another man like he was a god. 
And it didn't matter what it was going to cost him. He stood his ground on his faith. Yeah. And this, this, this man that was against him, his name is Haman. And Haman, oh, it would make his blood boil every time he saw Mordecai because Mordecai wouldn't bow down. And so he, he, he was hatching a plot against Haman or against Mordecai, but not just against Mordecai, but, but, but against all the people of God. He hatched a Hitler-like plan, an Antichrist-like plan to wipe out the Jews. And, 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 and listen, as, as he was pursuing this, one night the king couldn't fall asleep, and he had his servant come, and he said, you know, can you read to me from the city records? He said, I think there's things I haven't learned about yet. And so the man began to read from the city records, and he began to read about how there was a plot to assassinate the king, but it was stopped by this guy he had never heard of named Mordecai. And he called in Haman, his right-hand man, and he said, what should the king do to honor someone in the kingdom and to declare that he is the blessing of the king? And Haman, being so arrogant, how many of y'all know the enemy is arrogant? If it seems like he's going way too far, it's because he can't help himself. He's just that arrogant. He always overplays his hand. Remember that. And so he said, well, what I would do is I would go get the king's royal horse and I would put the royal robe on him and, and I'd put the royal shoes on him and I'd find your, your most uh, powerful man and I would parade him through the streets saying, this is what the king does for the man who honors the king. And the king said, you know what, you know what, Haman, that's a great idea. I need you to grab a horse, grab a robe and go get Mordecai the Jew. Come on. But it doesn't stop there. This man so hated Mordecai that he had built the, the highest gallows to hang him. He had hatched a whole plot, not just to kill him, not just to kill his family, but to kill all the Jews. But he didn't realize that God had placed Esther in the king's courtroom. See, you don't have to have everybody for you. And she spoke to the king, and she uncovered the plot that was against her people, against the Jews. And the king was so angry. And listen, the very gallows that the enemy built to destroy Mordecai, the king told him, these are gallows for you. And that very night, he and his whole family hung. Yeah. Oh, come on. This is better than your acting. And then he said to Mordecai, you know Haman's old job? We just got an opening. <laughs> and you're just the man for the job. Come on, come on, come on, come on. The Bible says, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. And his word hasn't changed. Come on. Let God be your defender. He says in Romans 12, 19, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. To give place is to, means this, to leave God room to do his job. Leave God room to do his job. In other words, as long as I'm trying to get back at him, as long as I've got my hand in it, I'm keeping his hand from getting in it. If I'll just pull back and say, God, you be God, then God will begin to fight my battle. Notice this. Give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is whose? I will repay, says the Lord. It's interesting that we use the phrase, take revenge. But if you notice here, who are we taking revenge? We're not taking revenge on somebody, but we're rather taking revenge from. A couple different times the Bible speaks of us robbing God. First of all, in Malachi 3, when it regards the tithe and offerings. But here he talks about when we rob him of his job of vengeance. Tell your neighbor, don't rob God. Now tell your neighbor, but let him fight for you. 
Come on, church. It's why David, when he begins Psalm 23, says, the Lord is my shepherd. He even says it's his rod, it's his staff that, what? Comforts me. God's defending me. In verse 5, he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Oh, that's good. (laughs) Saying... They had a perfect plot to bring me down. He said, but instead, they had to watch God bless me anyways. In the presence. Oh, come on, church. He says, you anoint my head with oil. Do not go after God's anointed. He says, my cup runs over. You can't take the blessing of someone that's blessed. Balaam tried to curse Israel and said, he looked at the king and said, how can I curse what God has blessed? Oh, wow. In other words, they keep talking bad about you, but while they're talking bad, God's elevating you. (laughs) The more they run you down, the more God lifts you up. The more they curse, the more God blesses. You don't need everybody for you. David needed a Goliath, didn't he, to elevate him. Even even Joseph's brothers betraying him. He looked back at them years later and said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Sometimes somebody comes against you because it's the way to get to your destiny. He'll prepare a table for you. Anybody else here, though, ever just felt surrounded by the enemy? Been in a situation, you're like, I don't know how he could possibly work this together for good. I think of Israel. They're looking at the Red Sea, and right behind them is the mightiest army on the planet, the Egyptian army, and Pharaoh himself, with his gleaning eyes, getting ready to pounce upon them. And, of course, the people were afraid in the natural. And they began to to complain to Moses. They began to attack Moses. But then God spoke. Exodus 14, 13 says, And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Just stand still. He's saying, Don't be afraid. Just stand and watch. It's like he was saying, the movie may have been scary up to now, but lean in on your chair. It's about to get good. Because notice this, he doesn't just say stand still. He says, and see the salvation of the Lord. Tell your neighbor, the movie's about to get good. (laughs) The salvation which he will accomplish for who? For you today God is for you and he's fighting your battles for the Egyptians whom you see today you shall see again no more you'll never see these Egyptians again see what the enemy wanted them to do was wander around feeling like they were just runaway slaves but listen God when he saves you doesn't say you're a runaway slave he says you're my son you're my daughter I bought you you're in the family of God your enemy's been defeated he says for the Lord will fight for you and you will hold your peace wow and so what did God do he set the fire between them and Pharaoh How many of you know the presence of God will surround his people? The anointing of God will come around your family. The presence of God will come around your house. I believe this. He'll set his angels charge over you. The Bible declares it. And then an east wind began to blow and that water began to part. And the ground began to dry. And all the people of God crossed through on dry land. I tell you to tell you something. If it looks impossible, God's about ready to do a miracle. He's setting you up for a miracle. And so they crossed on dry land. But when the Egyptians pursued, they all drowned in the sea. 
When you go into the next day, they begin to celebrate and they begin to sing and dance. And Exodus 15 verse 1 says this. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him. My father's God. Because remember, he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, and I will exalt him. Notice what they say in verse 3. And they hadn't known this until they came to the Red Sea, but they learned something that night. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. They learned something new about God. They might have known him as God Almighty. They might have known him as the creator. But they hadn't realized that he was this personal. And I ask you, how much about God do you really know? Like, I could preach the cross and maybe you know, yes, he's Savior, right? But what, what about what I'm going through this morning? What about what I've been facing this past week? I've been going through trials. I've, been, I've had doubts. I've had worries. I've had difficult things. I've had things happen in my life I can't explain. And this is what God is saying. When I saved you, I didn't just want to meet with you then. I wanted to walk with you and meet with you every day. And the situation and the difficulty is where you can encounter God and learn something new about him. It was at the Red Sea that they found out the God who saved us is the God who fights for us. He is a man of war. And so God would say, take what you're going through and use it as your opportunity to seek his face. And in that trial, in that place, you will learn something new about him and your faith will grow. Oh, Moses began to even encounter this beforehand at the burning bush. Look in Exodus 3. At the burning bush when God began to confront him. See, Moses thought his call was over because he'd messed up. But how many of you know the gifts and calling of God are without repentance? Amen. Amen. And so God began to speak to him, began to recommission him. And in Exodus 3.14... It says, and God said to Moses, see, Moses asked him this question. What if they ask me, what is your name? Who shall I tell them that you are? And so God said to Moses, tell them, I am who I am. It's the first time he reveals the name Yahweh. I am who I am is say, I am. I'm eternal, self-existent. And I am all-powerful, all-sufficient. And so Moses is getting a download that no man had ever received before as he encounters God at that burning bush. And God is wanting to download into us more of who he is. He's wanting to reveal to us, I'm more than you think I am. I'm more than you've encountered so far. We can't exhaust who God is. I believe through all eternity we will still be learning more and more and more and more about our God, his knowledge, his love, his holiness, his vast and endless He says, and he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. If he is all sufficient, then to say I am is to say this, whatever you need, whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, don't turn to the world. Don't turn to the enemy. Don't believe the lies of the enemy. I am the answer to whatever you're facing. I am the one who will bring you through the valley. I am fill in the blank. I am your savior, yes, but I am your healer. I am your peace. I am your defender. 
I am your everything. See, Psalm 78 speaks of how Israel limited the Holy One of Israel. They would say things like, well, God, you did this, but you can't do that. Tell your neighbor, stop limiting God. Say it, church. Come on. I'm preaching. I'm talking to you. Will you talk back to me, somebody? Come on. Don't sit there like I'm preaching dry as dirt sermon. Nobody used to drinking cracker juice unless you chose to. Let's take the limits off God in our lives. Don't put him in a box. Man. When you realize that your God is for you, you begin to let him be your defender. But number two, you let God be your everything. There's no category of our life that he shouldn't be Lord. There's no room in our heart where he's not invited to rule and reign. Let God be your everything. I want to begin to speak now about how God revealed himself in Scripture in various ways. And I'm not going to go in any particular order. But I just want us to begin to, to take this in, how God is our everything. In the Bible, in 1 Kings chapter 20, the mightiest army at that time was Syria. And they had surrounded Israel's capital, Samaria. And it looked like there was no way out. The destruction was for sure. But God sent a word, and God sent the victory. But you have to realize that Samaria is up in the mountains. And these people were very uh, uh, superstitious, and they had false idols. And so in 1 Kings 20, verse 23, when God defeated them, it said, Then the servants of the king of Syria said to him, Their God are the gods of the hills or the mountains. Therefore, they were stronger than we. But if we fight against them in the plain, surely we will be stronger than they. Listen, there is no place where God isn't God. There is no situation on this planet where he ceases to be Lord. I love, I love the story. I was hearing of a back... A preacher who had backslidden and he was on drugs and in a bar and he was in their party and then all of a sudden the presence of God came all around him and God spoke to him and said, son, what are you doing in here? And his immediate response was, well, God, what are you doing in here? God will go with you anywhere. And how many of you are thankful that he's just not with you on the hill, on the mountaintop? Because, see, that's ultimately what the enemy was trying to say. God was with you in the good times. He was with you when everything was going good. But then when we're in the valley, when we're in the darkness, when we're in the deep, the enemy wants to say, well, where's your God now? And you would need to be able to say to him, my God who's the God of the mountain is also God in my valley. The God who was with me when I was winning, when I was successful, when nobody doubted me, when everybody looked up to me. He's the same God when everybody comes again against me he's the same God God is for you in the valley can anybody say amen, amen. man that's good and God says, I'll give you the victory in every situation and I know that God was listening to their conversation oh really you think I'm just the God of the mountain how many of you don't know that that time, the next battle, the Syrians got beat twice as bad? Listen, God is with you in your valleys. He's with you in the dark and the difficult times. He will, his word says, never leave us nor forsake us. And so as we read on in Exodus 15, remember they were having this party, this celebration. Because they just walked across the Red Sea and they had this revelation that their God is a man of war. But God will bring you even more victory than that. And I'm ready to tell you this morning, if you're going through a valley, your celebration day is coming. Remember what's on the other side of the Red Sea, everybody. 
Remember what's on the other side of what the enemy's trying to do. How many of you know, even to the very end, when it looks like the enemy has won, Jesus steps out on the clouds riding a white horse with a banner and a name that's all nobody knows. And listen, but he won't be alone. We'll be riding with him, dressed in white. Oh, come on, church. Is anybody else saved at Cornerstone? Has anybody else got their eyes on Jesus this morning? Ooh. Wow. And so God says to them, I'm not just a man of war, but Exodus 15, 26, he said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. In other words, make Jesus Lord. I will put none of the diseases on you, which I have brought on the Egyptians. Notice this, for I am the Lord who what? Heals you. It's the first time he declares to his people, I'm Jehovah Rapha. See, that's a name that God had not given his people yet. They didn't know that he was the Lord God who heals them. Are you grasping this this morning? And I think there's a lot of people out there, like they know God in a certain way, but they don't know him yet as Jehovah Rapha. But listen, the same God that fights for you, the same God that saved you, is also the Lord God who heals you. Anybody here ever need a healer? Oh, I don't know about you, but sometimes I need my heart healed. Does anybody ever just need the comfort of the Holy Spirit? I think a lot of people are hurting people because they're hurting. How many of you when we have undealt with issues? Our issues will manifest. And we just need healing. Amen. I don't know about you. I've I've lashed out at somebody before and they hadn't done a thing to me. I know you haven't done that, but It's because I wasn't healed over what had happened to me earlier in the day. I hadn't got over what had happened. Listen, let God in to your heart and bring healing. Listen, and if it's pain from people, God knows how to heal people pain. I'm here to tell you something. If you've been traumatized, there is a day through God's power, you're going to wake up and you're not even going to think about what they did to you. You'll be going through the day, and all of a sudden, it's going to hit you. I haven't thought about that all day. And then there'll come weeks, and you'll realize, I haven't thought about what they did for weeks. I'm free. He who the Son of Man sets free is free indeed. We're free. God is our healer. God is our healer. God is our provider. He's our provider. God who had promised to Abraham a son when he was 75. And of course, we know it took 25 years for Isaac to actually be born. And here's God's, or Abraham's precious son, and he begins to grow up, and he's a young man, and God says to him, I need you to take your son, and it's interesting, he says, your only son, and take him to Mount Moriah, and sacrifice him. Think about this. He has no idea that Mount Moriah is where in, in 1,500 years after this, God himself would send his only begotten son. Yeah. Yeah. He goes. He stops his servants on the way up the mountain. He says, you all wait here while the lad and I go on to worship. It's the first time worship's ever mentioned in the Bible. And I want you to hear something. Worship was not a song. It was a life. His worship was giving God everything. And so he goes up the mountain and he prepares the altar. And his son willingly lays down. 
just like the Son of God did. And the father raises the knife, and finally, as he's getting ready to drop it, the angel of the Lord shouts out, Stop, Abraham, for now I know that you fear God because you would have withheld nothing from him, even your only son. And he saw over in the thicket a ram caught in the brush. And on the way up the mountain, he had said, The Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. How many of you are thankful when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God provided a lamb. God provided a sacrifice. And so Abraham, he says something here. Look, in in Genesis 6, or Genesis 22, and Abraham called the the name of the place the Lord will provide. It's the name Jehovah Jireh. As it said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be. Be provided. How many of you are thankful that on Mount Moriah it was provided? The Lamb of God, the, the sacrifice was provided. Oh, come on, church. He provided the ultimate sacrifice. And years ahead, Abraham, God's friend, got to see it. And that's why Jesus could say, Abraham looked forward to my day and he rejoiced. Oh. Do you know him as Jehovah Jireh? Do you know him as your provider? Did you know that the God who saved you will provide for you? Did you know that church? But he's not just that. He's not just that. He's the one, if you're walking through difficulty, will give you peace. Oh, I can feel the enemy doesn't like me talking about this. You know what that tells me? I'm going to keep right on talking about this. Because the enemy's had you stumped somewhere in your walk with God. You've known God up to this place, but now you're kind of stuck there. But God is revealing who he is to his church this morning. And he's getting you unstuck. He's getting you out of that valley. He's getting you past that point where you couldn't get healed, where you couldn't get past what happened to you or what's happening to you. In Judges chapter 6, the angel of the Lord came and spoke to a man named Gideon. He was threshing wheat down in the valley. Why? See, you threshed wheat on the mountaintop where you could get wind. But he's in the valley because he's gripped with fear. But the Lord says to him, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. I'm here to tell you this morning, you've got strength you didn't know about. That thing you didn't think you could go through, yeah, you can. That situation you didn't think you could survive it, you're going to more than survive it. You're going to thrive through it. Of course, he begins to question the Lord of God's with us and why are the Midianites defeating us? Why are all these things happening? He's got his eyes on the situation instead of on his God. But God begins to show him confirmations of how God was with him and was going to use him mightily. And listen, this man who was in such fear all of a sudden became a hero of faith. And the Bible says in Judges 6.24, so Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord is what? Peace. To this day, it is still in Ophrah of the Abazarites. Listen, it is there that God revealed himself as Jehovah Shalom, the Lord God, your peace. It was in the valley in the difficult situation. It was when Gideon was gripped in fear and worry that he learned that God would give him peace. How many of you are thankful that God is with you in the valley when you're all worried, when you're stressed, when you're full of anxiety? He's there. He's Jehovah Shalom. I want to share just a few more. I would ask your permission, but I would do it whether you gave me permission or not. We're getting unstuck this morning. The rut ends today. It's interesting. 
We think sometimes our mistakes are the end, and God could never use that. And I think of Abraham on his way to having Isaac, but about 10 ways in, 10 years into the promise. At that point, Abraham was 85 years old, and his wife was 75, and Sarah came to him and said, apparently God must have another plan. And, of course, the plan was her plan. And she said, why don't you just lie with my servant, Hagar? Gentlemen, how many of you all know if you would just think about that for a second? (laughs) This is a really, really bad idea. Amen? If if you're trying to please one person, (laughs) but he doesn't pray about it. He just wades into it. And of course, Hagar has a son, and, and of course it causes strife in the family. And Sarah is upset with, with Hagar, and, 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 and she can't stand her, and finally she, she throws her out of the camp. And so here's Hagar wandering in the wilderness, a single mom with a little son, thinking, God, where are you? Does he even see me? Have you ever wondered, God, do you even see what I'm going through? Have you ever said, God, do you see what I'm going through? Well, look in Genesis 16. Then she called the name of, listen, God began to speak to her there. And he gave promises over her and the child. And in verse 13, it says, then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. But notice it came through an encounter with God. For she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? In your difficulty, in your valley, when you feel like God isn't seeing you, he wants to encounter you. The way we come into this place is when we draw near to him and he draws near to us. He's the God who defends you. He's the God who fights for you. He's the God who heals you. He's the God who gives you peace. He's the God who provides for you. He's the God who sees you. And all along the enemy saying, well, who are you? I know what you did. I know where you failed. He's there to rip down. Listen, if you are on the team of rip down, get off of it. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He doesn't need any help. That'll burn up this microphone. That's why the Bible says he's Jehovah. I know this is an odd word. It's a Hebrew word for righteousness. Jehovah said canoe. When you look at 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For he made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. In him. How righteous is God? He's perfect, isn't he? And God says, if you are in my son, I have clothed you in perfect righteousness. Oh, my goodness. You know, every single stick-in-the-mud Christian I've ever met, one thing I know for sure, they don't know that they're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If they knew how God's grace had washed away their sin, they wouldn't walk around so judgmental of everybody else. Because they would know they were free. And they would know how much God had forgiven them. Oh, 
the Bible says that he's faithful and just to forgive us of all of our righteousness if we'll just confess our sins. Oh, you, there is nothing like knowing Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord God, our righteousness. Man, I got saved and I got in with a legalistic bunch and said, you got to do this and you got to do that. It's like Jesus' righteousness is here, but you're somehow going to do better than God did on the cross for you. And everything I did wrong because I'm just a baby Christian. I'm messing up and they're waving their finger at me. And that brings us to this last revelation of who he is. I'm not saying this is the highest, but for me it is. For me it is. And that's that he's Abba Father. In Romans 8, 15. He says, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. How many of you know fear is a bondage? But perfect love casts out fear. He says, but you received the spirit of adoption. whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. To adopt, see, he could have saved us and just said, your sins are washed away, and they are. But to adopt means to fully accept and integrate you into his family. You are in the son. Are you getting this? Yeah. He's integrated you perfectly into the family. Yeah. Well, what's that word Abba mean? Well, it's an Aramaic word that we don't really have necessarily. We hear little children call their father what? Could Jesus say, unless you become converted and become like what? Little daddy God. You know, religious people hate it when I say that. I'll say it again. Daddy God. He's Papa. He's most precious father. It's a term of endearment to speak of the person who's the most dear to you in all the world. And it comes from the inside. He says, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Jesus said you must be born again, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Yeah, <laughs> when you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. Yeah, and as you're walking along, the Spirit begins to bear witness with your spirit that you're a child of the Most High God. And when the, the accuser comes along and this world comes against us, the Holy Spirit inside us is saying, I've bought you. I've accepted you. I died for you. Oh. Nothing like Abba Father. Nothing like knowing Daddy God. Nothing like knowing he's the most precious in all the universe to you. And that he's with you all the time. I don't know how to be dry. I don't know how to be a stick in the mud. I don't know how to walk around thinking I'm better than everybody else. Sorry, but I know a God who made me righteous. I know a God when everybody comes against me who's for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, Caleb, you better get up there. Oh, oh my word. Oh my word. I love it in Nehemiah chapter 6. God had, through fasting and prayer, it enabled him and opened the door for him to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. The enemy had burned him down. 
Have you ever felt like your family's been to that point? You know what I'm talking about? It's like, how's, how's this ever going to get fixed? But God was with Nehemiah. And here's the thing about Nehemiah. He wasn't a divider. He was a uniter. Beware of one man armies. The shepherd gathers. So every family picked a part of the wall and they all worked together at the same time. When the enemy came to attack, he said, wherever you are, sound the trumpet. Sound the trumpet. God's fighting for us. And let's stand for one another. When the enemy comes, let's have one another's back. Let's stand in the gap for each other. And when the enemy comes with his lies because he came, two men, Sambal and Tob Tobiah, kept saying all these things, kept putting them down, trying to find fault in what they were doing. And they sent a message to me of Nehemiah, come down and meet with us. In other words, stop doing what God called you to do. And Nehemiah looked at them and he said, he sent them a message. I'm doing a great work. Why should I come down and meet with you? Listen, God is our defender. God is our savior. He is our healer. He is our provider. He is our peace giver. He is Abba Father. And we're his family. If somebody goes after you, he's going after me. never get built but because they were family they joined arms together and in just 52 days what the enemy said could never be healed and never repaired was built in full if God is for you Nobody can be against you. I don't know here, here today besides myself needs prayer, could use some prayer time, but these altars are open for us to press on in for a while and trust God to be our defender in everything we need. From this day forward, I decree and declare we will live as people who know that our God is for us. No matter what happens, no matter what comes our way, our God is a rebuilder of broken walls and he stands in the breach. We are his family. He is Abba Father and we are brothers and sisters in Christ and there is nothing that will ever change that.